Yep, it's good. Cool. I also hit record. Wow, mine is... Why is it so loud? What the... I'm so discombobulated by everything in my setup being different, and it's okay. I can fix it. I can fix this in post. Let me just crank this down a little bit. Just going to crank this little knob down. Nope, more knob. More. <laughs> uh. Okay. <coughs> Let me check some settings. This looks good. This looks good. All right, I think we are finally ready to go. Thanks for rubbing it in, Slim Jim. But um, just so you know, Matt has definitely already read the chapter. Like, I don't think Matt has been capable of waiting one day ever. No, it's part of my character, guys. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why you do it. Yeah. Okay, I am ready. I am ready, too. All right, let's go in five, four, three, two, one. one. Hey, everybody. Welcome to We've Got Ward, a daily plant productions podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss Ward while those return to the world of parahumans. My name is... Oh, shit, Scott. We forgot to come up with our team name. Oh, and now we're down to the wire. Okay, how about um, Team Picard... Deontology. Ah, yes. Perfect. Meaningful name, which requires no explanation. Yes, indeed. This is the weekly podcast where you and I eagerly dive into Wild Bo's world of floppy skin monsters, breakthroughs, and alien-based death powers as we analyze and interpret this ongoing web serial. This week, the torch continues with chapter 7.7 and 7.8. Victoria has a heated confrontation with Chris after showing up unannounced to his home, and Team Breakthrough finally gets its name. Rest in peace, Misfit Toys. Yeah, I guess we'll a, have to. You had a good it. run. We had can't a good just, run. Can't just keep calling it that. No, what well, I mean, how are we known to continue calling something by a certain way after we've been told that that's not what it's called? I don't no. think we've ever no. done that. And we're certainly not ones to beat a joke into the ground. So. No. I'm I'm insulted that you would that you would assume that. No, frankly. Yeah, well, right back at you. <laughs> um, yeah, um, this was a pretty pretty cool couple of of chapters. Um, we get to see some more of this setting that we've uh, that, that that you know it's being teased out to us that this this existence of corner worlds, and we finally kind of get to poke our nose in one. And I thought that was pretty fun, actually. Yeah, I think we're going to get to this when we talk about the arc as a whole when we're done with it. But I've really enjoyed just the the slow build nature of of each of these chapters so far. Like we, we go very slowly through exploring these different characters and different people. And I, I really like how we're doing this. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's let's move on into the into our, our discussion this week. So um, first, let's do our community spotlight where we read what people wrote from last week's thread. And if you'll recall, the discussion question was, is Victoria in danger of becoming an enabler? Um, EXE JPEG WMV says, probably not. And they say, Victoria seems a little too aware of people's potential for a downward spiral to occur for, for, um, for, for her to go too long without intervening. Um, but they go on to say that uh, it's not impossible, though. She she may, may well do so unintentionally just because she doesn't know certain members of the team very well. Yeah. Um, and I think it's that last part of the that statement that is most important to me is that this this acknowledgement that I don't think her enabling would be conscious. I don't think her enabling would be intentional, but I think it would come from um, a, a lack of understanding of these people and how to deal with them. She's put a lot on her shoulders. She put a lot on her plate. And she doesn't quite know the right way to um to approach a lot of these people as we see in in this week's chapter mm -hmm. so um I, I don't think we meant by this question anything anything necessarily bad intentionally bad about victoria or her behavior just accidental oopsie kind of enabling yeah right more like just her her background like tactics that she's employing are they adequate to this task um or is she going to accidentally 
uh, through through some of her personality traits or, or mistakes serve as an enabler. But I mean, it's interesting to see how people interpret it anyway. Yeah, for sure. Which leads us to Madness Factory, who says yes. Uh, they say, I think Victoria doesn't have the information she needs to act as a responsible leader. Sure, she has befriended and empathizes with most of the misfit toys, but she doesn't know them as patients or problems. And it causes her to be blind of the toys potentially relapsing into old habits. But they said that their money is on Victoria figuring out, hopefully soon, that she doesn't really understand most or any of the misfit toys. Uh, that last sta- statement ends up being pretty prophetic because Victoria states in these very chapters we're talking about this week that she doesn't get Chris, that an acknowledgement that she does not understand him, that she hasn't figured him out yet and is having a lot of trouble doing so. And um, I think that that's pretty central to the interaction that happens between the two of them. Yeah, um, I, I think I think that, like this, ne- this next person's uh, knocked and Nabel says... Um, th- they argue that like Taylor justified bad behavior for good reasons. Victoria is justifying permissiveness within her team and, uh, Noct points out that nothing really bad has happened thus far, but it could. And, and I think that's, that's interesting because it sort of depends on what you weigh as being really bad because basically two of the team members have already kind of gone down. I mean, it could have been worse, but they've sort of lost two team members for the time being. And you could argue that it was exactly this kind of permissiveness born of not wanting to push too hard, um, which led to that, which led to her not really knowing them and understanding them um, that, that led to that happening. So I think it's all kind of related. Like you can't just say, uh, yeah, the problem is that she doesn't know them, but the reason she doesn't know them is that she's too hands off and and almost she's I, I happen to think she's like afraid of pushing them away or scaring them off right so she comes off as very like well I don't want to pry and I'm certainly not going to ask any of the other team members what the problems are and I tried to ask Jessica and she kind of was really cryptic so I'm just going to sort of continue on and try to ask leading questions and then if they stonewall, stonewall me which way they, which they all usually do then I guess <laughs> I'll just completely continue to operate in the dark like it's it's not a great position, but you have to wonder, like, is she is she right in her kind of hands off approach? Yeah, I mean, I think the the most telling thing to me and, and I think we're kind of jumping the gun to a lot of the conversations we're going to have this week is. Each one of these people has different problems, each one of these people has different solutions to hopefully deal with those problems, but she's approaching them all with like this didn't work for this person or, or I did, I failed to do this for rain. I failed to do this for Ashley. Therefore I can't fail to do this for Victoria. I can't fail to do this for Chris. And they have completely different problems, completely different, um, issues. And a one size fits all approach is not great. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. And, and she's, she's kind of, she's kind of, you know, talk to them in order of her comfort with them, which, and seemingly leaving Chris for last because she's at least comfortable. But I think we have some indications that Chris is not someone that should be left for last, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, lastly, Shinichi says uh, she's not there yet, but it could be far too easy for her to get there. They point out that uh, with Victoria's desire to become someone who is hyper vigilant and removed from a tense situation, someone who can see people when they are cracking and risking becoming like like Amy, she's ironically setting herself up to be blindsided by exactly that. Um, she, she kind of wants it both ways. Shinichi is arguing that she wants to be that outside perspective, that outside observer, but she also wants to be a touchstone for her teammate. Uh, teammates and and by wanting to do both these things she's kind of setting herself up for potential blind spots where she thinks she's outside in reserve but she's actually in too deep and i like i like that idea that like i think this this echoes a lot of the other points which is that none of this enabling would be um intentional on victoria's part Mm -hmm. yeah i like this element that she's pretend she pretended to be distant from the team for a really long time and to have this like coach relationship but also it was always kind of clear that she she kind of needed it and she couldn't just be like look I need to know what your deal is or I'm not going to be comfortable working with you and I'm going to have to walk she's basically the whole time never been able to make that kind of ultimatum it's always just been like yeah well I understand everybody has their boundaries so I guess I'm 
along, even though for all I know, all of you are secret murderers. Um, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's, it's interesting to think about, even if, even if she didn't really make any terrible mistakes, it's interesting to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so moving on uh, to to the general discussion from last week's uh, thread and, and the events surrounding um, last week's uh, post. So recall there was a lot of talk about uh, Eclipse, and a couple people pointed out that the formal literary name for the mirrored palindrome-esque structure is uh, chiastic structure, um, and it's most commonly seen in the Bible, actually. Or as the white swir- the white squirrel says, Harry Potter. Um, they go on yeah. to point out that in the Hebrew Bible, the center is considered the most important parts of the text, which would support the idea that Jay, and more specifically Ashley's relationship with Jay, is the key to the entire arc. Yeah, isn't that? I I, I thought that was a cool thing to kind of circle back and and finally maybe complete our discussion of Eclipse, since we just don't want to let this arc go. But um, yeah, I, I think it's cool that. I was never, I was not aware. I, I think I've heard of that kind of structuring in the Bible before, but I, I had never heard of the specific term and, and did not think of it when we were discussing this. So it's cool to know that. Yeah. I, I remember it from when somebody said that the Star Wars prequels and, and like, like the Star Wars prequels basically formed kind of a chiastic mirror of the, the original damn, trilogy. The damn ring theory. Yeah. That's, I think that's more or less what the ring theory is getting at. Yeah. Um, but then Red Letter Media made a really good video about that being silly. Um, so anyway. <laughs> no, it's like it's like poetry. Yeah. It rhymes both forward and backward and upside down. All right. Let's get on into our chapter discussion, Scott. All right. So here we go. Chapter 7.7. And this chapter, Cole opens with Victoria doing some aerial sparring with Crystal. Yeah. And I really enjoyed this opening uh we once again kind of start in media res with the a pace and tone that almost implies victoria is like mid battle and we're almost immediately like oh shit what's up but then we shift down from that to victoria like musing about the the mode that driving requires and how flying has its own mode that she has to shift into and and the casual nature of which victoria's narrative sets this scene up as you're kind of like wait, what's going on here? It, she was fighting, but now she's like casually musing about driving versus flying. What's up? And then, of course, Crystal is revealed and, and it all becomes clear. And I think this is really just like a great example of how writing can manipulate your emotions. Like, like I think we tend to use the word manipulate when talking about art negatively. And I, I don't I don't like that, Matt, because like all art is manipulative. That's what it's trying to do. It's try like art is an empathy machine. Stories are an empathy machine and they're trying to make you feel a certain way. And they do that by manipulating you with the words. <laughs> and so I, I like reject this idea that I, I basically use this as a platform to whine about people calling movies and books manipulative because that's they're all they all are. This is what they do. Yeah. I kind of wish we had like a um, connotationally neutral word that meant the same thing as manipulative because like everything is manipulative. A conversation is manipulative. You're trying to manipulate yeah. the other person's mind into knowing the information that you're telling them. I mean, it, it's it, yeah, it's it's um, you're trying to create a certain state in a person. And that's yeah, that's manipulation. Sure. But yeah, it's it's the the, the purpose of the art more or less. Yeah, it- it wants you to feel things. So it's going to manipulate you to get to the feelings it wants from you. That is what stories do. Yep. I mean, yeah, I just, I, I see that so much when I'm like reading reviews of, of books or movies that say, oh, I just felt so manipulated. Like this is a movie that wants you to cry and it's going to manipulate your emotions. And it's like, well, no, it wants you to tell you a sad story. And the result of that sad story will probably be you crying. Yeah. Right. The only time that I don't mind that is when the point is like, the the attempts at manipulation were obvious and lacking in art right um then the, then that's just more like yeah well they just didn't do a good job yeah and that's i mean i think that's when you when you get break down criticism like that that's what they're saying is not that um the the criticism is not that it's manipulated the criticism is that they didn't do a good job at manipulating you yeah um right all this to say um I liked the start of this chapter. <laughs> I kind of went off the rails here a bit, but um, I enjoyed how this kind of leads you through a gamut of emotions as you're trying to figure out what's going on to begin the chapter. 
Yeah, me too. Um, so yeah, so they're, they're, they're sparring and, um, Victoria gets a bit bruised due to not having told Crystal about the wretch and thus Crystal was attacking at closer to to full strength. Um, and I'm sure this sort of thing where she doesn't tell people about the wretch and then she gets hurt. I'm sure this isn't setting up a pattern and this choice that she's made won't bite her in the ass in any serious way in the future. Yeah, uh, there's a moment way back in uh, arc three, chapter two. And thanks, Prof, for finding the chapter number for me because I couldn't find it. I just remember this happening. But uh, Sve- Sveta is pointing out how strong her, her body is, how strong her armor is, basically. And Victoria kind of thinks to herself, well, when people know you're really tough, they tend to go harder on you. They tend to go all, all out. They don't hold back. And we're kind of seeing that circle around a Victoria here. Um, everyone knows, everyone that knows Victoria pre-Gold Morning knows her as this indestructible heroine with the shield that a lot of people think can't be uh, knocked off. And they treat her that way. And that's just not true anymore. She can't leave her shield up all the time anymore. It's just not how it works. And it, it, it's her like we're seeing again and again this this reticence to share the truth about the wretch with the people that she knows. And I think it's very understandable from an emotional level why she does that, but it it is getting increasingly more and more dangerous as you're around more and more people that knew you from back then and are going to treat you as if you are still that person. And yeah, I think you're right. We're being kind of subtly like pushed in, in the direction of, of really thinking about this and thinking where this could go. Yeah. It reminds me of what happened to her originally where, the slaughterhouse nine managed to really grievously injure her. Um, you know, and, and that wasn't even people who were holding back. I think what's interesting here is we're setting up a situation where even someone holding back could end up hurting her fairly devastatingly, um, because they assume she's invulnerable. And that's, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I think we're putting, putting here. I think you are correct. So the two cousins chat a bit about family stuff, like how they used to all fly in formation. I I really love, Matt, when uh, the story stops to place an emphasis on the familial aspect of these two characters. I think family is such a, a rocky, um, complicated thing for Victoria. But Crystal seems to be the one exception to that rule. Um, and it's it's the one person in her family that she's mostly comfortable around. And I think we have to remember that hanging out with Crystal when, when, when at the end of the last chapter, when Victoria listed this long list of stuff that she had to do, this incredibly long list of stuff that included possibly preventing the end of the world. Um, one of the things she listed was making time for her cousin. And here we see that she's doing that. I think this shows just how much importance she places on this relationship with her cousin. And I think this conversation is especially impactful when you realize that the people that Crystal is talking about in it um, are dead. With the exception of Carol, her mom, her brother, uh, their family has gotten wrecked. And Crystal brings them up here. With She's the one that brings them up. There's no real reticence to bringing them up. There's only this one brief moment where she says little brothers are a pain and she smiles with a little bit of melancholy behind it. And I don't think this is to say that Crystal isn't suffering the trauma of what happened to her family. She absolutely is. We, we saw her reaction to death very early in the book and, and what it did to her. And I think that's probably connected to how many people in her family she's lost. But I think we're seeing her deal with it at a level that like um, is someone that's that's doing the right things and dealing with the things that have happened to her in a good way. Um, she's able to talk about her mom. She's able to talk about her brother uh, and I think this to me says this is a person that Victoria, you need to lean on a bit here. Um, This is a person that could be valuable for you and could help you and could help you understand. She's going through stuff herself and she's gotten to a place where she can at least talk about it publicly and, and not be completely devastated. And I just, I like that a lot. Yeah, that is really interesting. And that's not something that I thought a whole lot about. I did, I did kind of, I did actually go back and look at the wiki just to kind of prove to myself how many of Crystal's, immediate family were dead and it's all of them all all of them exactly um and another thing that strikes me like you just said that she obviously had trouble at the broken trigger event scene and what's interesting is that like most capes in this world now in this post end of the world world have lost probably several loved ones but 
the difference between the average person and Crystal is that Crystal lost most of them in like cape combat and they were capes. So she probably has a lot of specific anxieties surrounding, you know, actual cape combat, not just like, oh, you know, the general the general uh, trauma of, of loss. It's loss specifically centered around, you know, costumed heroics. So yeah, it is it is kind of impressive. And, and I, I don't know, I suppose admirable that she continues to 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 go at it and, and to try to do this thing. Uh, and, yeah, I, I like this this point that she would. That, that Victoria and her, and her have a lot to learn from each other, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny because I think that the impetus for this whole interaction is Victoria is worried about Crystal's well-being, and um, Crystal is probably the exact same for her sister, or for her, her cousin, rather. Yeah, I think you're right. And then there's this lovely little beat here before we move on where... Uh, she crystal and victoria talking about how crystal used her as a surfboard and she says like yeah that's so much better and she says it kind of is besides no dirt on this these feet and i just like this little bit of detail where of course someone who flies would not have dirt on their shoes because why would you walk around (laughs) if you can fly and it's this little beat like this little like common sense of course beat that you probably would never have thought of but uh this book does Mm -hmm. yeah that is that is funny yeah but also remember when victoria told how like isolating and disconnecting flying can be i had to remember that Mm -hmm. crystal you flyer yeah that it's interesting how that particular motif is being used in in this couple of chapters actually um yeah yeah, it's, it's it's funny now that you sort of primed me to think about crystal in this way i'm i'm wondering if she's doing as well as she seems um, but that's that's yeah. of course my constant uh, skepticism of it's that all, damn chocolate. All the characters, yeah. There, I mean, and I mean, we see here that Crystal is on some classified mission that is not classified because they've never used the word classified, but it is secret and she can't tell anyone about it, which is what classified means. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I think like we're seeing the yeah, other. Some, there's some stuff going on. There's some heavy stuff Crystal's group is doing that she's involved in that we don't know about. So yeah, I mean. I don't want to say that Crystal is like totally mentally healthy and, and, and she's the, the, the paragon for, uh, Victoria to look up to here, but, um, I think they can lean on each other a little more. I think, I think she needs to tell her cousin about the wretch. That's what I'm getting at. She's, she needs to tell us like in, in, for every reason, for safety, for mental health, for part of their familial bond. That's something that needs to happen. Yeah. It's almost as if the text wants us to want victoria to (laughs) tell people but then she continues to not do so no no it wouldn't manipulate us like that scott no that's too manipulative so (laughs) so now victoria flies to chris's orphanage and uh speaks to val while she waits for chris to show up oh here we go um there's before we get into this whole thing because we've got a lot to say about this uh there's one thing i wanted to point out here because i think we kind of maybe i'll swing back to it a little bit later but as victoria flies she's looking out for random landmarks in the city to orient herself she she points out the the portal she points out kenzie's areas the shopping center they broke into the the norfair community center it's as if we're like going by the big events of the book or or some of the big events of the book one by one before we prepare to move on to the next phase of the story um i I liked that little beat yeah that, that that's a neat um I like that you interpret it that way. I think it can also be interpreted as just while Bo is reminding us that this is a setting and that the places are all located relative to each other in a meaningful way. Like, I think we got a really firm sense of the geography of Brockton Bay by the end of that story, um, by the end of Worm. And I think we're starting to build a sense of how these things are connected to each other. Um, and rather than just being kind of isolated areas, this is, this is like a much more expansive area. So I think yeah. it's harder to see them as like, you know, immediately part of the same, like they're not really the same city in the same sense that Brockton Bay was a city, but uh, yeah, it, it makes the world feel more put together. It just makes it feel more like a, a setting that you can exist in. Yeah. 
So now they gossip, uh, uh, her and Val gossip about Chris while both pretending that they respect his boundaries. Um, <laughs> I kid, I kid, uh, kind of. Uh, because they both clearly want to know more about his situation and they're both worried about him, but they're wary of saying too much, so they really just skirt the edge. Yeah, and I love the way this conversation is kind of constructed. We start by pointing out the reaction Val has when Vicky mentions Chris, like her expression immediately changes and and she immediately sends the kid that's playing near them further away so they can talk privately. There's a lot of build up here and they are kind of both testing each other like they're talking very in, in kind of code. They both want to talk about Chris. They both want to learn what the other one has to know about Chris. But they're but as you said, they're both kind of worried that they'll betray his trust and, and betray his privacy. And um, it, it's kind of this 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 push and pull game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's this really interesting moment here where where Val says that Chris seems to have the best relationship with her than anyone else in the group. And, and Victoria's response is maybe because you're pretty. I thought, then I thought again, Chris seemed like the type to prefer a hard nosed adult. He could predict and rely on over the friendly sort. Maybe it was both. And I think this is so telling to me because she kind of says, maybe it's this thing, or maybe it's this thing, or maybe it's both of them. And I think this is pretty illustrative of the fact that she doesn't, get him she doesn't understand him and she's she's guessing at things she's trying to link things together but um she's not even sure enough to conclude on any one thing and she's like well maybe it's both of the things and i think this is a pretty good prelude to what exactly is going to go down in this whole conversation yeah it's also kind of funny that she considers like oh yeah he he talks to you because you're you're pretty and it's like Victoria is frequently described or referred to as being like a, a a bombshell, basically. But Chris doesn't give her any special like right. attention. So the the hypothesis that he's that he opens up to pretty women does not seem to have any support for it at all. So and you'd think yeah. that would be something she could figure out if she kind of thought about it. But she's just she's just pulling at straws here. Like she's yeah. just trying. She she's he's so confused and doesn't know what to make of him. And so she's, she's trying to link anything she can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I really like while we're discussing Chris, while these two characters are discussing Chris, some, we see a child misbehave. We see this kid sky do something wrong and Val just handles it. Matt, she just handles it. The kid is ready to fight. It's cricket kicking. It's screaming. She's not listening to reason. And Val just grabs her and just goes into like a, a straight jacket mode until she's calm. Yeah. And this so, is all correct and normal uh, parenting and child care behavior. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yes. <laughs> so we know this woman has a, a better relationship and, and a level of trust with Chris that we haven't really seen in anyone in, in, in this, the story thus far. Um, and we've just seen how she handles a difficult situation. And I don't think it's an accident that this is happening while they're having this conversation about Chris. I think we're, we're connecting the dots here. This is how Val, Val handles things. So perhaps this is metaphorically a way that to, to handle Chris, um, we see in this moment that Victoria wants to intervene. She says, Oh, I almost jumped over the the fence and, and came to help out, but she doesn't because she doesn't want to out herself as a Cape. But Matt, she's not needed to intervene here. Val had it. Val handled it. Victoria does not understand sky, this kid enough to know what the best way in the situation to help is. She doesn't know Val does. If Victoria were to have intervened in this thing, it could have only made things worse. You kind of kind of see what we're doing here now. <laughs> we are. We are you laying out some breadcrumbs for us? Just just a little bit. Just a little bit. All right. I, th- I think we'll I think we'll make this this line of thought perfectly concrete in a in a moment. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, so they talk about how Chris goes on a lot of long walks, which it's pretty clear. They're both aware mean opportunities for him to use his power. They both understand that he needs to use it, and the orphanage gives him allowances to, you know, skirt the rules a bit. 
the kids and the admins are scared of him, allegedly because it's so apparent that he changes over time. Although I took a bit of a hint that maybe there's more to why they're scared of him. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if there's evidence for that. It's more of an intuition. Um, also, they've had some thefts of medical supplies, which Victoria strongly suspects were due to Chris, uh, due to her knowledge of his special inclinations toward medicine and keeping his body put together. Yeah, um, so there's there's a whole lot here, man. There's a yeah. whole, whole lot. Uh, the, the volunteering and walks, all of this speaks of this really tenuous equilibrium that is established here that that this this kind of okay we know you need special treatment um it, it's kind of a live and let live policy that any thing could could possibly mess up it's also really sad like it's really sad like people th- this idea that people are scared of him and it's you're right there's hints of other things but but what we're told is people are scared of him not because his behavior but because of his changing, it creeps people out. It makes people uncomfortable. The things that happens to him when we'll learn the specifics of how gruesome some of this stuff is a little bit later. But the one thing that he can't control, the one thing that he needs to do is the thing that's that's making all these people afraid of him. So like the fact that he has any kind of good situation, here almost feels like a, a damn miracle. And anything that could could damage that that equilibrium could could be really bad for Chris, for the people around Chris, for everything. Like, I don't know, for example, like a teammate showing up and confirming basically that the suspected medical equipment theft was probably definitely him. Like by silently confirming that that could really throw a wrench into everything and that kind of stuff. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, or maybe that's... maybe the hero work, the moonlighting as a hero thing when like capes are really not thought of positively right now i I don't know i don't know just stuff like that i don't know it's it's interesting because we're in victoria's head and it's very easy to uh or it's very tempting to dismiss his concerns um as you know oh he's just a kid uh, because that's basically what victoria does but but also it doesn't take much you know effort of flexing your, your empathy to realize just like you said it probably is um very taxing for him and exhausting to to try to keep up this this balance um of of his life um and of course you know the the last thing Val says about him is she describes him as uncanny but also as desperate and i guess this is maybe one facet of that desperation but it definitely goes deeper than that and we're not really privy to what that means exactly yeah i like those words so much uncanny is such a great way of describing chris and, and I love how she describes his desperation, too. Like she says, everyone else here that's desperate for something. I've been able to figure out what that thing is with this kid. I have no idea. And that's that ties into the whole uncanny nature of it. Um, it's that the mystery that is Chris. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he obviously wants something powers related, but we we're still on the hook for what that is. Yep. Um, so Chris finally shows up and he's obviously very angry, angrier than we've ever seen him. And he believes that Victoria is here because she wanted an excuse to snoop, um, though she claims that she came to, to deliver the message from the team uh, since the comms are down and his phone isn't answering. Uh, of course, we know that both are kind of true. Yeah. And classic wild bow complex situation creating it's both. <laughs> Yeah, I really I really love the writing here, though, like the front door of the building slammed. Chris just stood beyond the doors looking for me, finally spotting me. Oh, he looked pissed. The front door slams like the 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 oh, he looked pissed is such a wonderfully constructed, simple and effective sentence. And once again, if we can drive down into the meaning of individual words, I I love how putting O before he looked pissed kind of warps the meaning of, of this statement here. Because like, if you just said he looked pissed, that would just be kind of a statement of fact here, but putting the O before it, um, adds some of Victoria's mindset here. It it puts in a little bit of her thinking like this, this almost seems like a, Oh, here we go. This is, this is kind of what I worried was worried might happen going into this. And, and we're here now. And I think it's just a, like this simple word that just enhances the sentence so much. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I don't have anything to add there. It's just, yeah, it, it feels more emotional. Um, yeah, so Chris storms out of the orphanage, making Victoria follow. Um, and he 
he continues to become angrier and angrier as she pushes back and maintains that she needs to keep an eye on him. And he eventually gets angry enough to go for a weak point, bringing up Amy as a weapon. Oh, shit. That's, that was the jaw drop. Now you done it moment of the chapter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, he, but like in this tirade, he's also angry enough to say more than he usually would say. And he reveals that his body is kind of a mess and he leaves weird internal bodily fluids on his bed sheets and he poops out blood and meat. And Victoria guesses that maybe it's somebody else's power at work, um, which we don't really get confirmed other than like a look from him. Um, and, and because in, in her in her mind, powers don't usually mess up their hosts like that. Yeah. And once again, the mystery that is Chris deepens. Uh, do you have any kind of guess as to what could be going on here at all? I have not been able to, like, tie anything together here. No, not not really. I mean, I, I feel like we're being led to that answer of maybe he has his own power and then there's another power working on him and he's yeah. having to put himself back together using his power. And it's kind of like a constantly losing battle which is why his body keeps changing constantly over time and we lose his teeth and stuff um and he's just trying to keep himself alive and that's you know hence the desperation yeah. but but i feel like there's obviously a lot more details than that and some of what i just said could still be wrong so yeah yeah um probably worth pulling this out because it comes up again later um so chris is so mad that he says um re referring to amy I'll go to her for help before I go to you. I'd go to Bonesaw if she was still around. I shook my head, walking away. He raised his voice. You want to push me? I'll push back. I stopped in my tracks. That kind of pushing gets you killed, I said, or worse. <laughs> yeah, we'll circle back around to that brilliantly constructed exchange by Victoria there in a minute. But um, this is kind of where this conversation ends. Um, and... and it's it's about this moment that it was I think it was right before this moment where or right after where Chris decides to reveal the building that Amy lives at. And and as much as we've seen Victoria make progress as far as Amy is concerned when she brings her up, this stops her in her tracks. This hits her hard. This is so debilitating to her. She says, I didn't want to know where she lived. And I have to go back to this is why I brought this up earlier, because we had this moment where Victoria was flying through the city and pointing out landmarks and places uh, that she's been and, and knows before. And now a new landmark has just been added to her list, a new thing. Whenever she flies through uh, the city, she will see and know what is there and know who is there. And it's not it's not great. Yeah. Yeah. I, lo I love that you've pointed that out because. While she just knows Amy is somewhere, then she doesn't have to think of her existence concretely. But now she right. knows, like, oh, yep, she's there. She's a person. She's right there. I could go. I could stumble across her anytime I'm in that area. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Matt, Chris and Victoria, let's talk about this, because I was kind of surprised to see how much argument and um, like fighting that occurred in the community and and controversy that this this whole fight had um that i figured there would be when i first read it um there are people out there that are convinced that victoria was absolutely within her rights to come to the orphanage and check orphanage and check on chris and that he was completely out of line and and childish and and wrong in reacting the way that he did there are people that think what victoria would did, did was way over the line and not cool at all and Chris was well within his rights to fight back. Um, my opinion is both of those are right. <laughs> here's here's what I think about this, and, and you can let me know what you think. But I think Victoria came here with wonderful intentions. She was worried about Chris. She was admittedly uh, afraid of failing him the way that she feels like she failed both Rain and Ashley. Although, interesting enough, the two people that are in jail are like the two characters that I'm the least concerned about right now, which I don't know if that says something. But anyway, um, I don't I don't think she has the right to show up unannounced here, but I could see a case where she feels like it is her responsibility. Chris could hurt himself. Chris could hurt others. And she's here because she cares for him. Yeah, um, I think her intentions are definitely good. I think that other people have made this comparison in the discussions, but I think like 
Uh, and I'm not going to, I guess I'm not really going to come down to you hard on either side of the argument per se, other than to point out that this is a very Carol move right here to, to be like, <laughs> to be like, but I have, but I have the best intentions at heart. Also, I know better because I'm older. Yeah. And therefore I can basically, I can basically cross boundaries because you're, because you're a kid and you're not really you don't really know what you're doing and you say that's a boundary, but you don't really understand what you're saying. And I'm just going to take care of you and I need to be the one who takes care of you. And that's kind of exactly what she's doing. And it's kind yep. of exactly what her mom is doing to her. And Vic- Victoria's like inner monologue about this is like exactly what you imagine Carol's to be, which is just like brat, you know, like, 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 <laughs> yeah. why, why don't you, why don't you listen to me? I'm, I'm just trying to take care of you. Um, yeah. And, and and why are you lashing out at me so so cruelly when I'm just trying to take care of you? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. V- Victoria handled with the best intentions, handled this whole thing really shitty, like really bad. And, and and as we indicated earlier, and as the the chapter was kind of pushing us to to realize, is how little she understands Chris, how little she gets him, how little she knows how to approach him, knows how to 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 get to him, and man, she just shows up and tries to brute force her way into fixing the problem and it just doesn't work. And I'm not saying because she doesn't understand him because she doesn't have the tools. It doesn't mean that she shouldn't try, but she kind of just kind of like puts her head down and just keeps charging forward. Even when it's very clear that her tactic is not working here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, now, it's in- Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, it's interesting. We don't really, until she gets angry, we don't really know what exactly her tone is in this conversation. Um, and it, it's kind of up to you to fill in what it is based on what we know of her. Yeah. Um, and I wonder what people, I wonder what kind of the median reader assumes for her tone for this scene. Yeah. I mean, I, I, in, in the Carol way, I thought it was very kind of, um, I don't want to say condescending, but I think it was very, authoritarian i guess yeah um, yeah like like i'm i'm in the right here and i don't know why yeah. you're being unreasonable that, that yeah. was kind of how i read it too and look was chris's reaction um too strong yeah did he did he cross a line by bringing amy into things yeah he's a total asshole here but he's not like he's not like entirely wrong either we noted how how the the chapter made pains to show us kind of how tenuous this relationship is, how um, these the people that he's living with don't like him for the most part. They mostly put up with him. And I'm sure a lot of these people would would jump at the opportunity to 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 remove the problem and any kind of introduction of new stuff to this equilibrium could mess it up. So like Victoria does not fully understand that she does not understand the precariousness of the situation before she brutes force her way into it. And, and so yeah, he's pissed off. He's rightly pissed off and he wanted to make Victoria angry and he knew just how to do it. And look, it worked. (laughs) It absolutely worked. Yeah. I mean, it even, it even made sense to him in the sense where he's like, if you're going to cross my boundaries, I know where your boundaries are. Right. So, you know, let's, it, 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 I'm not saying he's being like rational here, but there is a certain logic to being like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to incentivize you to back off and stay yeah. backed off. Well, I mean that beautiful line where, where he mentions Amy and she says, don't go there. And his response is perfect is, is don't come here. Like that's if Amy is your line, look, this is mine. Yeah. And look, Chris is a 13 year old kid. Like he's going through some shit and he's he's a kid. His body, Matt, is changing in in weird ways that he doesn't fully understand yet. Yeah, that's it's it's puberty. It's like a metaphor. Anyway, um, he's going through this big thing and he's a kid and Victoria isn't equipped to help him with it. I love that we kind of even reinforce here that he is a child like, yes, I think this is kind of Victoria dismissing him a little bit when he says there are times when he seemed so adult and there was times when he seemed so young. This was the latter. And that's true. Chris kind of threw a little temper tantrum here, but he is a kid 
Victoria is older, and Victoria, by assuming the role of coach, of leader, of person that is going to help the rest of the team solve problems, um, when she assumes that responsibility, she has to also then assume responsibility um, to the idea that when things go wrong, she might be to blame for them. And I just think she messed up this this so much. Yeah, yeah, I... I uh... I agree. I mean, it, I, I love this as an example of one of Wild Bo's like conundrums that have, have no solution and thus breed endless debate because right. it, like it's certainly not a fictional problem to be like, here is subject A, 13 year old, male or female, doesn't matter, doesn't want you in their business, has drawn out their boundaries, but they're 13 and you know they're dumb. How do you respond to this situation? <laughs> right. I mean, that's the that's the conundrum of every parent of a teenager, basically. Except now they're superpowers, which is why this is parahumans, is it yeah. superpowers as metaphors for things exactly. normal people go through. Yeah. So I think I, I think one of one of the most important beats of, of Victoria not handling this super well is um a- Amy is brought up. And and he's angry and she follows him down that anger tunnel just like he wanted her to. And she starts she she gives that threat, which he which we'll get. We'll talk about that a little later, but he interprets as a threat. I don't think she actually meant it like that or or she did, but not a threat coming from her, a threat coming from somewhere else. Um, And then and then she says this thing like like you better watch out for yourself because I don't want Kenzie and Sveta to, to have to mourn for you, kind of indicating that I don't give a shit if you die. It's those two that do. And then she leaves. And this is, I think, like he there's something really interesting here where he says train stations this way. And that's when she says she says, walk fast. You here's where you got to be. I'm leaving. And then she she really leaves this 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 line where he says train station is this way, as if to say, are you coming? As if to say, even after all of this, he wasn't going to be the one to storm off alone he was still going to to be around her even if he's pissed off at her but she leaves and i think her getting so angry that she leaves and even as she says for his sake is probably like in my opinion one of the worst mistakes she makes here because if we go back to this val and sky comparison where we had sky basically this little girl throwing a temper tantrum and val just like grips her and holds on to her until she calms down what if in that situation sky had like kicked val in the arm or something and hurt her and val got pissed off and said fine if this is what you want do it and then just just left like what like that would have been a terrible like any parent would look at that and say oh, that's probably not how you should have handled that and and since we're drawing comparisons to to how she handled this i think we have to to draw that further out here to say like you probably shouldn't have just just flown away in this moment like you like it was probably not long term the best solution yeah well and and i i love that you you pointed out this motif of the flying being a mode of separation in this very chapter and we're using not, she doesn't just storm away she flies away it's like a, a perfect underlining of this idea of mm-hmm. i am choosing separation yeah yeah and i mean I, that's and that's kind of where it's kind of where i end with this whole thing is like sh- do i do i respect victoria for being concerned about chris um both for him and because of him and and wanting to see if he, she could figure him out and learn more about him. Yeah, absolutely. I think she means well here. She she's trying to look out for people. She's trying not to to she's trying to help protect people. That's great. Um, but she messes this up. She really does. And Chris isn't perfect here either. I don't want to make it seem like like I don't think we need to be on a team here. I think this was a messy conversation where two people got emotional and and said things they probably shouldn't have. And that's where we left it. Like, I don't think we have to declare a winner and a loser of every single conversation. Yeah, it's just still definitely been fascinated, fascinating to see the 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 debate over this. Yeah, yeah. I feel like this is one of those things that's going to continue too, because it's 
kind of timeless. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so now Victoria, you know, she leaves. She 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 flies to the portal where she meets up with the team who are having an important discussion about back hair. <laughs> this back hair conversation is like a pretty good release of tension after the the dr- drama of the Chris Victoria fight. But I think it it's doing a lot of cool things at the same time. Like. It's one of those things I, I'm going to talk about this for a bit, at which seems ridiculous because it's back hair. <laughs> But I, I, I think th- how each of these characters react to back hair is like a way to fit into both of their personality, their, the definitions of them as a character and the things that they are going through. Um, Sveta is OK with it because Weld has back me- metal. <laughs> Um, and, and perhaps because for, for someone like Sveta judging people by their physical appearance is probably something she's not like super down with. That would, that would make sense, uh, as, as a thing Sveta wouldn't love to do. Kenzie is okay with it because her favorite people have it. Um, which in, Sveta is, is, interprets as older people, ergo I- inappropriate for her to be calling them her favorite people, which, which perfectly ties back to Kenzie's historical issues with inappropriate behavior around older men that has gotten them in trouble. Um, Byron and Tristan are fighting over the guy who had it, thus illustrating their continued internal, I guess you can call it an internal conflict. It's not really, yeah. but I guess we'll call it that here. Sure. Um, Victoria hates back hair. Why, why would Victoria like not like things growing out of people? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. just like it's just like this perfect encapsulation of all these. I, I just the smallest things can do so much. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's that's it's pretty funny that that uh, I, I like that connection with Victoria in, in particular. But yeah, no, it's 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 just another um, great kind of tension diffusing moment where we're once again reinforcing who these characters are through something mundane and then kind of clearing the palette for the next thing to happen. Um, mm-hmm. and, and of course that next thing is that they move into enemy territory. Yeah. And, and as we finish this chapter, um, I really like this idea that they're in the city, which is technically a, a home for Victoria. Um, she, she calls it stressful and overbearing. The accumulated stresses were weighing on me and it was hard to breathe. And then she moves into earth N, a place of fresh air, trees, birds, and fields. This thing that you would traditionally consider like serene and peaceful. But this, this is enemy territory. This is where the bad guys are. And I like yeah. that kind of dichotomy there. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the last line of the chapter is enemy territory, right? Where like she's describing it as this beautiful place and it's it's uh, it's dangerous. Yeah. So, yeah, we move on to, into 7.8 and Victoria is is now mentioning that Chris will probably still be pissed when he shows up, uh, basically priming everyone to expect that when he when he comes. And uh, they have a little discussion of kind of team dynamics Sveta says that she can relate to Victoria's concerns, recalling how she regrets not paying attention to more of the red flags with the irregulars that she witnessed. And they all, all the team members feel like they missed opportunities to stop bad stuff from happening with Ashley and Rain. Yeah. And I think this is why things are so complicated. This is why I don't think Victoria was wrong in what she did, merely how she did it. Chris says he's fine. He's not. None of these people are fine. But there are the correct ways to help them and look after them. And there are the incorrect ways. I think the most important thing to me here was Victoria admitting to the team, admitting publicly that she doesn't really get Chris yet and that she could have handled things better. Um, She took responsibility. She realized that did not go well. She realized she could have been the one to handle it better. She takes responsibility for that. That's good. That's good. We see here that at least one good thing that came out of this encounter between the two of them was that she learned something. Yeah. I really like this. There's a, there's a beat here where they ponder if, if the reason Chris was so angry was because of some uh, rage, emotion induced stuff based on his form changing. And Victoria 
kind of like dismisses that. Like she says her gut says, I I don't feel like it was connected to that. I think this is intriguing and part of the whole Chris mystery, but I think it's another point I'm going to award to Victoria here. She's calmed down a bit and she's in a place of understanding where she thinks she gets why Chris was so mad. Like I understand why, what I did upset him so much that I don't think this was a, a powers produced emotion. This was just him angry. And I think, again, that's showing that, that she has processed something in this conversation. She also doesn't like, she understands that, yeah, I don't understand him. This happened because I took the wrong approach. And she also doesn't jump to any kind of like, oh, well, next time it'll be better because I'll just take this other approach. It's like she really is just trying to be cautious. And she's like, I don't know. I don't know what the approach is here. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, when Chris finally shows up, it actually seems like the thing he wants to focus on is the perceived threat that she made in parting. Um, which was not what she meant. So when he basically accuses her of threatening him with death, he says, go on, I really want to hear how you justify it. And then she says, going to Bonesaw for help before you went to me out of spite, that's the kind of thing that gets you killed or worse. Um, so so basically he's he's apparently been stewing on this misperception of what she said for this whole you know, half hour, I forget how long it was exactly, this whole train ride. And she could have averted that misunderstanding she just hung around for a minute right yeah yeah i i think it's really great that we do this because i think one thing you and i have talked about a lot so far in this book is perception and how perception alters how we look at at everything because that's what perception means anyway um (laughs) (laughs) it, it influences how we communicate and the results of that communication I can fully understand that when Victoria said this, Bonesaw killing Chris was absolutely what she meant. And maybe a little bit of Amy, too. Like, she didn't say Amy, but come on. Come on. Yeah, right. um, but I also, like, fully understand how Chris would hear this and interpret it that way, interpret it as a direct threat to him. And that's what happens when we get in these heated, angry conversations is we things break down communication breaks down we start thinking with our emotions rather than with our brains and we perceive things in a way that that matches with our anger so a a pissed off chris said absolutely she just threatened me and victoria is fully unaware that it was interpreted that way until hey they calm down and and maybe talk this part out logically yeah yeah and he accepts it. He believes her here, right? He says, I believe you. I, I, I believe that that's what you meant, that you did not mean it as a threat. And this is kind of the conclusion of this fight for now that they've reached like a, a tenuous peace agreement. Um, and I, I appreciate, I appreciate that Victoria realized she was wrong. I appreciate that, that Chris didn't try to push the issue and say, no, that's not what you meant that he accepted this, that he was like, our characters have calmed down a bit. Yeah. And I mean, it's it makes us like Chris a bit that even though he lost his temper there, he is capable of calming down and he still stays a bit angry at her for the rest of this kind of chapter. But um, I don't think it influences their teamwork, which I think is the important thing. Yeah. And, And that's what makes us, you know, like him a bit more here. Yeah, sure. Um. Um, there, there's, there's a beat here that I wanted to, to point out, um, sure. where they're talking about Chris and, and the communication problems with, uh, getting a hold of him because his phone was dead and internet in the area was down. And Kenzie says, I could do a phone thing. And Victoria responds, you're doing too many things, which was so good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Kenzie responds, but this is important, which is the same line of argument she made when they wanted to break into the building, but this is important and they still kind of halt her here. And that was, that was encouraging. Yeah. Now we'll see if they actually like mean it until the next big crisis comes up and Kenzie can solve it. And they say, okay. Yeah. Or if she shows up with the phone thing and she's like, yeah, I I did it. And I had to pull (laughs) three all nighters to do it. Um, and then they just accept it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's there's also a moment here where Chris explains why his phone was dead, that he went out in the middle of the night. He went for one of his walks. He changed into quiet awe and listened to music and shut out the world. 
Um, he claims that he got back at around 1 a.m., but he wasn't sure because the the power was off. Um, we know from Val that it was closer to 2.30 a.m., and this makes the the paranoid person in me like wonder if Chris is not being entirely honest here. Like, I don't I don't have any reason to believe this other than I'm kind of want to believe it because because I'm so confounded by this kid. Yeah, it's interesting. We don't have any specific reason to like be suspicious about a lie of yeah, like an hour and a half. Like, like why wouldn't he just tell her he got back at two thirty? Or uh, well, because he just might, he might literally, literally he just, just not know care. Yeah, or yeah, he doesn't know or care, and he's just like I don't know, late. Yeah, I, I mean that's what seems most likely to me. Although it would be interesting if it were some kind of yeah horrific twist. This is my Byron's chocolate. Just let me have it. That's that's fine. I I love that you have a Byron's chocolate. Also, my Byron's chocolate is Byron's it's chocolate. Byron's, Byron's chocolate. Yeah. Um. So the so they mosey into Earth and together. Um. And it turns out this is a corner world controlled by Lord of Loss uh, with about one hundred fifty thousand settlers, most of them clustered around the portal. And apparently, it's a rougher existence out there. We get the description. Roofs were often corrugated steel. I saw houses with additions that were plywood with plastic tacked to them. Others were best described as cabins. So, so yeah, this is not... And, and specifically, she thinks about how the materials for construction in Earth Gimmel were, were basically put there before Gold Morning, so they mm-hmm. were ready, whereas places like this are kind of ramshackle because they're being made from scrap almost. Um, so it's a very different feel of the settlement. Yeah, yeah. And Victoria notes some people with minor injuries as they make their way in. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you pulled all this out because what we're doing is here we're drawing a distinct difference in the way of life compared to things back on Gimmel. Um, the, the subtle beats here, the the injuries, the def- we'll learn later their defensive injuries. Um, we're kind of showing what the cost of this way of life is. This this kind of reminded me of like what warlord skitters goal was realized on a, a large scale like 150,000 people like relative to other establishments is not that big but to be under control of one team and basically one man that's like pretty impressive to to do that and victoria describes it like we're seeing like suffering and and injuries and and describes it despite the fresh air as a strained and desperate atmosphere And this got me wondering if, like, we're going to see more comparison between life on Earth N and contrast it with what's happening on Gimel, what's happening in the city. And as uh, things are escalating there and collapsing, like, are we going to see we're going to see a comparison to how like the warlord way of life um, survives crisis versus um, what they were going for in the city? Uh, I just there's a lot of potential there. Yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to see if the story goes that way. Uh, It's definitely this whole concept of the corner worlds I always thought was a fascinating aspect of this setting. And I'm happy to see that we're touching on it now in the narrative. Yeah. So, yeah, they find an alley in which to change uh, change into their costumes. Chris explains that he's going to be using strained piece and that this and what's interesting here is Victoria asks, what does that mean? And he kind of gives her a glare and you think he's not going to answer because he's mad at her. And this is kind of that moment where he then he does answer and it's like, oh, okay. So he's, even though he's mad, he's cooperating. And I think that goes a long way. So anyway, he he explains that strained is a modifier to the forms uh, along the lines of like repressed anger, tense acceptance, paralyzed fear, stifled disgust. So basically it's like a slant on the underlying form that gives it faster reaction times and more durability at the cost of lower stamina and strength. Everybody upgrade your spreadsheets accordingly. We got some more some more Chris information yep. here. We got another dimension. Yeah. I, I really love this beat where they walk out of the alley and everyone sees them in their cape costumes and everything stops dead. Like there's they they, they read some people as uh, open hostility. They like some people are just concerned, but everyone looks at them. Sveta describes this as similar to what would happen with the irregulars when they would walk in. This is similar to w- when a bunch of case 53s would walk into a place and people would stare and look at them like that. But these aren't monstrous capes. These are just 
capes. And I think while, while Earth N might be different, I have a feeling that the, the general anti-cape sentiment that's going on might be just as strong here, if not stronger. And uh, we could see we could see this being like the escalating point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're seeing more notes of that torch theme of the peasants with their torches and pitchforks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hasn't gotten quite to the point of open combat that we've seen. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot more hostility than we've seen at this point in the story. Yeah. And, and then we get Chris's reveal of his um, strained piece form, which I'm not going to read all of this, but how did we have an entire conversation about Ry- Wildbow's descriptive writing and not talk about the descriptions of Chris's forms? I don't know how we dropped yeah. that ball. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I mean, that just, I guess, a brief uh, aside, like there's a difference between the fact that Wildbow can imagine incredibly you know, engrossing things and the, and like the craft of describing those things. Those are two different yeah. skills and he's good at both of them. So, um, I don't know it, that just yeah. popped into my head and I thought it was interesting. It's a monster shrouded with skin. <laughs> like a, like a robe that you could mistake for clothing. It's a skin robe. <sighs> a, a hooded robe. Yeah. The hood up over it. It's made of skin. Have they made art of this yet? Has someone made I don't, art of this I yet? I haven't seen it. If, okay. if, if, listeners, if there's art of this, send to us immediately. Yes, please. Super tall, gangly with a skin cloak, no <laughs> mouth, and a beard. <laughs> totally normal. And, and and moves in jerky, snapping motions because yeah. he's he's tightly wound i love that the the looks that they got from the people were before chris revealed himself yeah. like everyone's staring at them and then the text is perfect here is like this is not the time to be revealing a monster in the party yeah and <laughs> it's it specific, chris specifically says he like dropped his cloak which i interpreted to mean like he walked out amongst them and then turned off kenzie's cloaking device right meaning he just kind of like morphed into being k- towering above them yeah he's just suddenly there yeah oh man awesome so wonderful so now they get to walk 10 minutes to the meeting place and <laughs> meanwhile kenzie casually hacks into the town surveillance system cool yeah just doing that yeah so they meet up with nursery lord of loss and bitter pill plus others that victoria doesn't recognize None of them are exactly friendly, but none of them fit the descriptions of the violent ones that she knows about. Yeah, more more subtle clues that are kind of filling in the pieces of what this place is like. Um, seeing capes here that we've seen in other places, like hints that as Hollow Point collapsed, some of the capes fled and went other places, um, but not all of them. I think the indication that there are none of the violent Hollow Point capes here kind of shows that, that Lord of Loss might have a zero tolerance, like policy like his way goes like none of the more reckless and uh unhinged ones are here um and and so we're we're drawing a a big distinction between this villain hideout and the villain hideout that we saw earlier in the book yeah i think you're right so we see some handful of capes are having a stare down with capricorn uh we don't get to figure out what this is about though yeah i think this is like low-key one of my favorite parts of the chapter though, because like it, it's clearly, we're clearly setting things up for the future, but I love how the stare down is written. We're, we're finally like, we're preparing the readers to finally maybe get some information on Tristan and his past. But for now we're just left with this very like visceral stare contest between these two sides. I mean, l- look at this. Three men were staring us down. They wore simpler costumes with maximized utility belts between utility between the belts pouches and bandoliers they'd strapped on as i walked past i realized that they weren't focused on me on chris or Luxi. sveto was between me and capricorn they were looking at him or her not her i realized i saw past the eye slit in capricorn's helmet and saw his sharp focus on the same men sveta didn't seem to notice them okay like <laughs> i love the way that we eliminate 
who it is one by one. Like we start, it's not, not this person, not this person, not this person. Okay. It's one of these two. Uh, no, it's not this one. We eliminate them one by one. And we're finally left with Tristan. And I think that that shows how impactful this is. Um, and, and then it's confirmed via Tristan's involvement, via his sharp focus, his staring back. And then later we have a moment where Capricorn barely paid attention to the power that was sweeping over him. He was focused wholly on the three men that had been staring at him earlier. So this this is something like this is something huge here. Like he's being examined by a person and is ignoring that to just stare at these guys. And we've done such a good job here of establishing like this is big. This is big. Whatever this is going to be, it's big. Yeah, right. It's like anything that gets under Tristan's skin this much is, you know, definitely very fascinating to us as, yeah. as readers at this point. Yeah, I don't think we've ever seen him, with the exception of Around Moonsong, I don't think we've ever seen him like this, like, s- focused and still and like it's, it's something, something's big here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll just have to see what it turns out to be. So yeah, this guy comes and he scans them, uh, making sure there are no traps and making cryptic remarks about Chris. Uh, he then asks their team name and their cape names. So they're forced to think of those now. Yeah. Surprise. Um, so before we get into those names, I, I just wanted to say how much I loved this whole interaction. The idea that Lord of Loss has this minion that will like powers wise pat down the good guys before they can meet with them the idea that he has to announce their name and their titles we have even have this little comedic three beat where we cut back to kenzie like slowly removing a ridiculous amount of uh gadgets and gizmos from her pockets like so many of them and this is very much playing in tropes like this is a meeting with the boss ruler of a territory it's a scene that if you've read books or watched tv or watch movies you've probably seen many times the the pat down the removal of weapons the announcement um this is something that that is used a lot in story but it still works really well and this matt is why i hate the word cliche because like tropes work because they're effective, like they do like the, using tropes here to describe this whole situation, like does something very effective. It, it quickly esta- quickly establishes the scenario to the level of which the reader can understand it. We know exactly what is going on here. We know exactly why it's going on because we've seen this many times before. Tropes can be useful in storytelling when used correctly. And they are here. And I think it works here. Yeah, what's what's funny is I didn't even like consciously register the whole like Kenzie emptying a comical amount of stuff out of her pockets as being <laughs> that particular trope until you pointed it out, which is always like tells me that's oh you used the trope correctly because I didn't notice it was the trope. Right. But yeah, I mean even if you notice it, I think you can use them well because if you're paying attention, you notice a lot more tropes. But that sure. doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that they're bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just it's a, it's a really effective setup. Um, and use of trope to establish the stakes and the situation and the scenario and everything that's going on here. We, we get it right away. Yeah. Um, all right. So Scott, so we're about to go into our names of all of our characters. So let's not wait till we get to the end of the chapter. Let's do this name game thing right now. All right. It's time for the name game. The time where we Google things on Wikipedia and make ourselves seem like we came up with them. Yep. Make it seem like we did a lot of research. <laughs> so Luxy decides that she is going to be Lookout. Um, I didn't see that coming. Did you? The the name change? I thought out of all our people here, Kenzie was the one who seemed to have the name thing down pretty pat. No, I didn't see it coming. Uh, but but I get it now that she's made the change. Yeah. Um, I, we had someone on Twitter as I was live tweeting, uh, mentioned something that I thought was pretty great. Uh, Asgar Zeigel pointed out that Kenzie was around when the team was discussing childhood Cape names with Tattletales group and how kind of embarrassing it was for kids to pick names when they were young and then grow up and have like these kitty sounding names as adults. Um, so on, on one level, it seems like look out is 
a more adult version of her name that sounds less kitty looksy kind of has a kitty ring to it and look out doesn't yeah yeah i mean it it's funny because she she takes it in reference to this joke where she you know what what she did with the fallen camp um <laughs> oh you mean the attempted murder yes but but also like it's uh, it's a it's actually so it's like a more defensive less offensive um name mm-hmm. unless unless you think about that specific reference because like look see means i'm gonna go take a look see i'm gonna go poke my nose around yeah and spy lookout means that you are defending the home base you're you're looking out for your friends you are you you have your eyes outward from you know some some point of defense so i mean obviously it's just the name but it does have some connotations and it makes her a little bit less you know voyeur themed and more like defensive theme that i think yeah. that's interesting yeah it also um makes makes chris happy yeah because it was his joke and he's and and i like this like it seems to be it'd be a very kenzy thing to do to um recognize that chris is is in a bad mood he just had this argument with victoria like we had this this whole thing where kenzy was very upset um that that there was a fight between chris and victoria she wasn't she was not happy about it and so she she wanted to help in any way she could and and picking this name is like a way of saying hey chris i liked your joke here you go and it it makes chris happy it works um, yeah i wonder how ashley would feel about this hey remember, yeah. remember that time i totally almost murdered people and you were really yeah. upset at me about it well i've embraced it now yeah yeah it's my identity now <laughs> i mean i think hopefully she sees that it's an attempt to make a i don't know a new beginning yeah um yeah so sveta chooses tress yeah which is something that sounds pretty but it's not really something she's in love with um she's kind of forced to make a choice here and she makes one um a tress by the way is a long lock of woman's hair which is probably the most positive optimistic way to view sveta's tentacles yeah I mean, so they do kind of trail off from her head like hair. So that's, yeah, yeah, I like yeah, it. I like the name. I like it. Yeah, I like I like it. Too. And it goes along with kind of the aesthetics and the fact that she is an artist. You know, like yeah. that she paints her costume. She's just an artist in general. She's she she would. It makes sense that she would focus on the appearance um, rather than like the function. You know, not like grab her or something. Like she'd go for something. Um, a beautiful sounding word that means a beautiful sounding thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris will be the previously discussed cryptid. Chris's name was perfect the first time we saw it and it remains perfect now. Um, it's, it's a, it's a great, it's a great name. Uh, a cryptid for those that don't know is an animal whose existence is either disputed or unsubstantiated. So Bigfoot, the Loch Ness monster, chupacabras, stuff like this. Chupacabras. Those are those are those are real, Scott. Sure, sure they are. Um, and then Victoria finally chooses her name, and now we get to see if we're <gasps> gonna pronounce it right. Antares. That's 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 probably pretty good, especially when we learn its origin. Yeah. Well, what's its origin? So this was a big surprise for me. Um, I, I don't think anyone who is offering up ideas for what Victoria's name would be would have guessed. That it would be a star in the Scorpio constellation. Did not see that coming. Victoria says she has a very specific reason for choosing it, but it's one that she doesn't have time to explain. So let's let's see if we can figure it out, Matt. Yeah, that sounds good. So Antares, also known as Alpha Scorpi, is the brightest star in the constellation and the 15th brightest star in the night sky. It's reddish when viewed by the naked eye. And as Tristan said, is also called the heart of the scorpion because like it's at the center of the constellation. Yeah. <laughs> um, Antares is so named because of a rough translation of the of ancient Greek that basically means rival to Aries or opponent to Mars, um, most likely because of its red hue matched that of the red planet. Aries and Mars, of course, are the Greek Roman god of of war. So Victoria positioning herself as the opponent 
to war would would be certainly thematically interesting, wouldn't it? Yes, certainly, certainly. Uh, however, some scholars also think the star could have been named after an Arab war hero, Antara Ibn Shada, uh, famous for both his poetry, poetry and his adventurous life. Uh, the dude fell in love with his cousin and they got married after he was freed from slavery and then did a bunch of adventuring and questing and wrote a bunch of poems. Um, he's been described as like the Eastern world equivalent or the, the Middle Eastern world equivalent of the legend of King Arthur. So pretty, pretty big deal. Um, I, I don't know if this really sheds any light on Victoria. I just thought it was cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, you know, Scott, every time we like skim over something in our name analysis, Wild Bo's like, oh, you forgot the secret meaning. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's I think it's good. I, I think um, someone pointed out there was some like Leo Scorpio thing going on with Victoria having this connection to like a lion through like a stuffed animal lion. And I, I wasn't I wasn't exactly I, I don't know anything about horoscopes or Zodiac or anything. And I couldn't really figure it out. Every time you type these things into Google, it's just like Google tells you Scorpio and Leo are <laughs> good at good together in bed. So I guess that's good. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, but I wasn't able to make any particular headway there. Um, I, I think I, I think I also read somewhere and I may be wrong about this, but that that um, this is like one of the brightest stars. So not only is it one of the brightest stars in the sky, it's also one of the largest stars um, like in that we know of. Yeah. Uh, which, which, which I thought was, was interesting. I mean, I don't think it has anything to do with Victoria per se, but I think it's an interesting fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, this is, this is really cool and I'm sure she's going to have a very interesting explanation for why she picked it, but I, I can see it circling around all these different things yeah also it's going to supernova sometime within the next um like thousand years or something oh. so hopefully that's not foreshadowing of any kind oh uh oh yeah maybe it's hundred thousand years i don't know relatively short astronomical time frame um yeah so that's and we're gonna have to figure out if it's antares or antares but uh anyway let's just say anti-aries antiers I'm just okay. going to call her Auntie Ares. Auntie Eaters. There we go. So, so the team quickly settles on Breakthrough for their team name, um, largely because it was the name that Swan Song liked. All right. This is it. Rest in peace, Misfit Toys. Yep. I'm still totally going to use it. Um, but I, 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 for some reason, Matt, every time I hear the word Breakthrough, I think of the Queen song, I Want to Break Free. And... So the entire day when I was working on prep for this podcast, I was hearing that song in my head over and over again. I, I don't know why it's not break through. It's break free. But that's how my my brain works. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> uh, Breakthrough's name is, is pretty obvious as uh, it, it psychologically it, it tracks like what they're hoping to achieve as a team. But also it describes their goals of cracking tough nuts, they say. Um, I, I really enjoy, enjoy that beat where uh, it's the one that Ashley liked as it's like a, a homage to their 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 teammate and, and friend that uh, that is gone now. But I guess we don't care if Rain liked it because he's gone, too. We don't talk about him. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I just hope that, you know, there's not some like tense hero situation where the, you know, the. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Chevalier is like, we need we need a team capable of smashing through this giant obstacle quickly. I don't have time to think. Get team breakthrough over here. I'm sure they'll be able to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, if when rain comes back, they can like ch- chop it. Yeah. Also, Ashley. The, 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 oh, yeah. Those two true. guys are good at Ashley's breaking perfect. through yeah. things. We need Ashley actually. back. And also Victoria could probably. Anyway. Yeah. So, okay. So just rope. We'll just delete it. We'll, we'll just, cut it. We'll cut it. Yeah. Scratch that. So the, so they announced themselves to Lord of Loss in his giant badass form. Uh, LOL says that he'll choose four people he trusts to stand with him so they can talk. And he calls his people amongst him. And the man that he calls is Mark Whisk. Oh, shit. Mark Whisk is back. Remember when everyone was like, is Chris going to be able to calm down enough to handle this situation? 
what we should have been asking was, what will Victoria do now that Marcus Swiss is in the mix? And I guess we'll find out next week. I, I, I guess we will. I tried really hard not to laugh while saying those names. <laughs> Me too. Me too. All right. Um, so this week's discussion question is as follows. Uh, so one of the biggest themes, recurring themes of the Parahumans universe has been the importance of names. Everyone from Yamada to Lord of Lost to Victoria herself has an opinion uh, on the names that we are assigned from birth versus the names that capes give themselves. Describe what you think Worm and Ward's central name thesis is and how Team Breakthrough's name selections enforce that thesis. Or or enforce or modify. Yeah. Just whatever. Or anything tangential to those sequence of words. Yeah. Here's your essay question. I expect two pages double spaced. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. And uh, that's... That's something I've actually been wanting to talk about for a long time. So I thought Uh it'd be good just to phrase it as a question to get everyone else's thoughts before I go on my probably two page speech. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually very curious to see what the answers are here, because I know that there's a lot to be said here. This is a situation where I'm just like, yeah, I have my thoughts, but I'm certain that by like crowdsourcing this question, we can get much like richer discussion than if it was just like, Oh yeah. They talk about names a lot, huh? Yeah. So that is all we've got for you this week on we've got Ward. You guys are all part of this show. So feel free to provide us with advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's reading. You can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or over on Twitter at gotwormpod. My personal Twitter is at Scott daily 85 and Matt's is at Marquos. If you're not already subscribed to We've Got Ward, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts. As always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, and all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. This week on Vow to View, Elise and I talk about our favorite dog movies in, in celebration of the release of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. That doesn't make a lot of sense unless you have my wife's brain. Uh, also, we should hopefully have a brand new episode of We've Got Weaver Dice here pretty soon, I think. Yeah, that's right, Scott. And if you like any of our shows and you want to support them, consider donating to our Patreon account, patreon.com slash Films. If you can donate a dollar a month or whatever else, else you can afford, uh, supporting us on Patreon gives you tons of great bonuses like voting in our quarterly fan art contest, Q&A sessions, access to live streams of our recording sessions, and our excellent Discord chat. Special thanks to new planeteer Z- uh, Lynn and Ziazur at the $1 level and uh, Kryptonian Roman upgraded to the $20 level. Um, that's awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Y'all are the best. Yeah, and, and as always, make sure that you go over to Wildbow's Patreon, patreon.com slash Wildbow, and donate to him as well. This is his world. We're just playing in it. And if you can't afford to donate right now, that is absolutely okay. You can fly all over to an orphanage and just start start talking to random orphans about We've Got Ward. It's how it works. Yeah. Um, or you can head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review. This week's review comes from Jazreel, who gives us five stars and says, Matt and Scott's studious pacing allows for a more attentive perusal of Wildbow's works than most readers invest, yielding profound profound insights into their essential themes thereof. They bring to bear years of critical experience, mix the genuine chemistry from their banter in, and you've got dozens of episodes to enjoy. There's a reason this is the only podcast I've stuck with for more than an episode. Wow, that is a compliment. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Jezreel. Yeah, yeah we, we really appreciate the kind words and you taking the time to, to do that review. Really appreciate it. Also, if you... If you want to listen to more podcasts, just hit us up. We got recommendations. I listen to so many podcasts. I could give you more that I promise you'll like. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the podcasts that I listen to are, are pretty good, actually. Um, all right. That's it for the show this week. Next week, Arc 7 probably continues. Yay. Marcos. Marquise. Marquise.